What's up, beautiful people? Hey, I hooked you guys up with Josh Broat. Let me tell you a little something about Josh Broat. Uh, we met on the basketball court, and uh, he is not a nice guy. So I don't know what type of act he's going to put on for you guys today. He's not nice. He's a stone-cold killer. He's an assassin. Um, and I learned to respect him real quick when we played basketball together years ago. I also respect Josh because he's been a faithful leader uh, to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes and just loyal and faithful serving uh, the youth of our community. Known him for a while and really just excited to introduce him to you guys. So Josh, thank you for serving us, man. Be you, dude. Um, and uh, have a great time, all right? And you guys have fun in our sanctuary. I'm gonna go back to uh, my sanctuary, which is out here for the next couple days. And um, you guys enjoy Josh Bro. Love you, man. Thanks for serving us. Love y'all. See you guys next week. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good morning. How you guys doing? Good. Good. Well, as uh, Doc said, I'm Josh Bro. <laughs> I'm honored to be here. Uh, I'm a licensed minister with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and uh, I have a title of the area representative for the San Fernando Valley for FCA. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about FCA. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story um, and kind of what God has been teaching me recently through a certain passage of Scripture. And so I'll lead us through that Scripture, and we'll talk about that. My hope is that this whole process will bring us together closer to Jesus. Um, before we do all that, though, let's go ahead and pray. Oh, Lord, we love you. We come before your presence right now. God, we ask that you would be with us. You would speak to us. You would speak your words of comfort, your words of encouragement, your words that challenge us um, to grow and to humble ourselves and to learn from what you have uh, in store for us today. God, I pray that you would open our hearts to hear what you have. In Jesus' name, amen. FCA, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, um, they're a great organization. I've been working for them for, uh, for the last 11 years, and uh, FCA's mission is to lead every coach and athlete into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. That's you. Uh, in 1954, a basketball coach named Don McClannan uh, saw that athletes were influential people, and he saw that they were selling gum and cigarettes and cars and all sorts of stuff, and he thought, well, why can't they use that influence for Jesus, right? And so he went to Branch Rickey, who was the general manager for the Brooklyn Dodgers at the time. And he said, Mr. Rickey, I have this idea. And Mr. Rickey was responsible for bringing Jackie Robinson into the league. He was a strong Methodist, just a, a man of faith, right? And so they talked for like five hours about this wonderful idea that, he, that this coach had. And Mr. Rickey said, okay, I'm going to give you some money, and why don't you go do a camp? And so he did a camp in Estes Park, Colorado. There were 300 athletes from around the country who gathered together, college athletes mainly, a couple of pros I think as well. And they kind of showed off their talents and skills and stuff, and then they all sat down together on the football field, um, and you had a huddle of baseball players over here. You had a huddle of football players over here, and they were all praying for each other, right? Sitting down on this football field, and you had the basketball and the softball, whatever, whoever was there, right? They were all in these little huddles on this football field. And then they broke, and then they said, all right, we're going back to our campuses. And they went back to their campuses, and they said, man, this was so awesome. Why can't we do that on our own campuses, right? And so that's where the idea of campus huddles uh, was birthed, okay? And so our campus huddles is a big part of the ministry that we do now. Um, Don McClannan was the one who kind of coached the coaches as they led their students in their campus huddles, and now that role falls to me in the San Fernando Valley and some of our other staff in the LA County area. Um, so here in the Valley, my job as the area rep uh, for FCA looks like this. I go around to various campuses where we have uh, FCA huddles, and I help start new huddles and campuses as well, um, and that's a large part of the ministry. The campus generally views FCA as a club, so um, since it's student-led and it's student-run, it's legally allowed, right? <laughs> I get that question a lot, like, how, how do you guys get on campuses? Well, if it's student-led and student-run, they have to allow it. So we just kind of are there to facilitate and help guide uh, along the way uh, for those student-athletes and uh, their coaches. And the coaches are really the ones who we start with. 
Uh, our ministry is often to and through the coach. And so um, we offer all sorts of stuff for the coaches as well. We do coaches' marriage retreats. We do coaches' Bible studies and uh, clinics and uh, stuff like that so that they can get better at their uh, skills with uh, regards to coaching. We also offer a lot of stuff for their athletes as well, including the huddle um, and different activities that we do, uh, camps and clinics and things like that. So most of the time, if a, a coach is a Christian or if a coach is interested in FCA, um, I'll work with that coach to find some students who they think would be good student leaders. We'll meet together, I'll give them some tools, and we'll get off and running with the huddle. Um, the huddle in the valley looks like uh, we, we are on a three-week rotating schedule uh, for our meetings. So usually on the first week, we'll meet with the student leadership team and we'll plan out what we like to call the huddle outreach, right? And the next week we'll meet and we'll have a Bible study. And that's just us together as the student leaders. And then the following week will be the outreach. So the outreach, what does that look like? Well, um, we have food and fun and games and uh, prizes and guest speakers. It's a lot of fun. In fact, Doc was one of the guest speakers. I think we have a picture of Doc over at Reseda High School. Um, he spoke in March and true to form, um, he spoke on marching towards the madness. Does that sound like Doc? <laughs> so there's a couple of pictures. Yeah, there he is speaking at the, uh, at the Reseda High huddle. Um, okay, huddles are a lot of fun. But let me tell you guys a little bit about myself. Um, and uh, if we could, if you don't mind, if we could turn this down a little bit just in the feedback area. <laughs> um, so a little bit about myself before continuing on. Uh, I have a confession. This is church, right? So it's a good place for a confession, right? <laughs> um, here it is. Uh, I've always had a high opinion of myself. Uh, I'm confident, kind of smart, witty. I think I'm good looking. So there's that. <laughs> Right? <laughs> yeah. A um, little bit more about me. Uh, my mom is Jewish. My dad is Gentile. Um, I was raised in a believing home, so we're believers in Jesus. Um, and I grew up in church, but I felt like I really worshiped God on my own for the first time when I went to a Christian camp. And that's where I really cemented my faith, and I thought, you know what, I want to pursue Jesus. Any of you guys ever been to a Christian camp or a retreat or something where you had a similar experience? Okay. Well, this Christian camp that I went to was an FCA camp. So that kind of changed my life, really. It put me on a trajectory towards um, sports and Jesus. <laughs> and that's where I found myself in college. I was playing basketball in college uh, at Life Pacific College, uh, now a university. Um, so I was four years playing basketball there, two years as an academic All-American. Um, I graduated with a Bible degree, went on the road with uh, a team with Jews for Jesus, and I led a musical evangelistic team with them for a year and a half. Uh, during college, I met a beautiful young woman and started dating her actually just prior to college. And so um, we actually got married after that uh, tour with Jews for Jesus. I came back and we got married. And um, I was a youth pastor briefly in Santa Clarita. And then uh, I joined staff with FCA. And things kind of started off slowly, um, as they often do, I guess. Um, I was tasked with raising funds for the ministry and doing the ministry, right? And so I had to raise 100% of the funds <laughs> and then go do the ministry, right? And so I was kind of shaky on the raising funds part, right? Um, but everything else was good, and I was enjoying life as a newly married man, and it was good. And um, my ministry was, was meaningful, and it was good. And then it started to not get so good, <laughs> It started to not get so good with the marriage. It started to not get so good with the ministry as well. And I was a little perplexed, <laughs> to say the least. I was confident in myself, but why is this going wrong? And things were rocky, and things were not good, and it, eventually it got to the point where I was like, I'm not sure if I'm going to make it. <laughs> in marriage, in ministry, I don't know what's next, but it's, it's looking really bad right now. Um, right about that time, uh, my mom has always struggled with some health issues, but my dad has always been strong. Well, I got a call from my mom, and she said, hey, your dad is going into emergency surgery. He has a 50% chance of survival for this surgery. And that was it. I just, I lost it. <laughs> I hit my breaking point, and I was like, God, why? Why me, right? I had this image in my head of myself as this good kid, 
you know, always growing up, I was a good kid. I knew all the answers in class, both in school and in, you know, Bible school, Sunday school, right? I knew all the answers. I had all the right things to say. I thought I was good. I thought good things should happen to a good kid, right? And now I'm a young man. Okay, I'm a man. I'm married. And I'm, I'm doing the right thing. God, why? Why is this happening to me? I don't know if you've been there. Hopefully you haven't in one sense, but maybe, maybe, maybe hopefully you have because God actually uses those moments. And he used that moment in my life. It was difficult. It was very difficult. Um, in the middle of this pain, God spoke to me and said, Josh, I'm going to give you peace. I said, I don't want your peace right now. <laughs> That's not what I want. But God is faithful. How many of you know God is faithful? Amen? Amen. God is faithful. And so he's faithful to himself and who he is, the character of who he is. And he gave me peace anyway when I didn't want it. And I didn't deserve it. <laughs> and it washed over me. And I knew it was going to be okay. I didn't know that my marriage was going to be okay. I didn't know that my dad was going to be okay. I just knew it was going to be okay. I knew that God was okay. And I was going to be okay somehow. Now, thankfully, my wife is here with me today. <laughs> we're together and we're working on um, our stuff. I'm working on my stuff because <laughs> uh, I got a lot of it. Um, that's what marriage reveals to you, right? <laughs> if you're married, you know. Um, so, yeah, things kind of worked out in some ways. But it's not 100% perfect. It's not a Disney movie, right? Um, but God is still here in the midst of my life. And that peace is abiding within me. And it's, it's there. It's constantly there. So, um, let's see. Shortly after my, uh, my experience with that whole situation, um, the FCA LA County staff and I began to pray for revival on our campuses. And we really began to pursue that together as a staff. And an amazing thing happened. Um, the Holy Spirit began to move in us as people, as, as the FCA staff, and in our students, and in our coaches, our athletes. It was amazing. The Holy Spirit led me, I felt like, to be vulnerable, and to be real, and to actually share what I had just gone through, which is really tough for me to do, especially as a prideful guy. Um, but I did it, and uh, God used it, because students began to come to Christ. In fact, over a period of five years between 2014 and 2019, my volunteer team and people like Doc and myself would preach the gospel on campuses. We saw 5,000 students make decisions for Jesus. Amen. Yeah, we can clap for that. That's good. <laughs> That's good. That was a miraculous event, right? That was definitely the Lord. Okay, so throughout that time, good things were happening. Things were growing. The ministry was looking good. And I began to get a big head again <laughs> and think, hey, man, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. I kind of deserve all this. The money was actually increasing as well. I was doing well. I was like, ah, oh, yes, this is, what I, this is what I wanted. This is what I deserve. Uh. Okay. Then COVID happened. <laughs> and I went from 20 campuses and 100 kids at each of the huddles to five campuses and maybe five kids at each of the online huddles, right? And it was not good. <laughs> I forgot to mention really quickly, just prior to this, it, there was a culmination of, of an event that uh, we did. It was called Fields of Faith. You guys may have heard of this or maybe even been involved with Fields of Faith uh, back in 2019. It was at Birmingham High School. Uh, we did a night to honor the pastors and um, Doc actually blessed the pastors and prayed over them before uh, we did the event. Almost a thousand people showed up for that event. We had 51 salvations at that event, 21 baptisms on the field. It was awesome. Amazing, right? And that was October of 2019. And then right after that, <laughs> everything went down the drain in so many ways, at least it seemed to me. Um, so, okay, let's, let's dig into the scriptures. Um, some of you may be like, when are we going to get to the Bible? <laughs> right? <laughs> and that's fair. Uh, but trust me when I say I've done this for a reason. Um, something I learned in Bible college kind of sticks with me. 
to understand a message, you must first understand its context, right? Um, or to put it another way, context is king. So with that, let's look at a king in the scriptures. But before we dive in, let's get some contextual understanding. We'll take a sip of water. So we're going to be in Daniel 4. Um, and Daniel, at this point in the scriptures, in the story of the history of God's people, um, God chooses Abraham, he has Isaac, and Jacob, and Israel, right? So we have Israel, that is a nation, and then they split up into two separate nations. You have Israel and Judah, right? And Israel disobeyed God, and God was not happy with them, so he sent a nation to conquer them. And then Judah did the same thing, <laughs> right? So he sends a nation to conquer Judah. <clears throat> that nation is Babylon. So the Babylonians come in, and they conquer Judah. And they take some of the best and the uh, brightest back from Judah, and they become known as the Jewish people at that point, Jewish Judah, right? Okay, uh, during this time, uh, 586 BCE, that's when the Lord's temple was burned to the ground, right? So Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, he was the one who was responsible for that. A side note here, and this is really interesting in my opinion, the Jewish temple was destroyed on the same day of the year by the Babylonians as it was by the Romans in 70 CE. So 500, 600 years there, right? Then later, much later, on that same day of the year, the Crusades started where 10,000 Jewish people were murdered. Then later, on the same day of the year, the Holocaust started officially, okay? This day is known as Tisha B'Av in Jewish tradition. Like I said, I'm Jewish, so I have a little bit of insight on that. Jewish people around the world are in mourning during this time. I wanted to pinpoint that today for a reason. It's because next week is Tisha B'Av, okay? So if you think about it, maybe say a prayer for Jewish people around the world as they are in mourning next week, next Saturday and Sunday. Okay, let's uh, talk a little more about Nebuchadnezzar. This guy was an amazing king in many senses, in the worldly senses. From the historical record, both inside and outside the scriptures, we learned that he greatly expanded the Babylonian Empire, which was the largest in the world at the time. Um, he rebuilt the capital city. He built himself a massive palace. He was responsible for one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, which was the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Now, in the book of Daniel, we learn that Nebuchadnezzar sees God do miraculous things for him twice in the first three chapters. Miracle number one, Daniel basically dreams the same dream that the king had, and he interprets it for him. Okay? The king then praises God and forgets entirely about the event, makes a huge golden statue. <laughs> Miracle number two, the king demands that people worship the statue, and then three people don't, so he throws them into a fiery furnace. Right? You guys know this story probably, right? Then he sees a fourth person in there. The king's like, oh, praise God. Then he forgets about him. <laughs> so that's, that's his pattern, right? He sees a miracle. He sees a miraculous, crazy cool event. Oh my goodness. How many of you guys have seen miracles in your lives? Anybody? Yeah, we've seen miracles, right? We're a believing church, right? I hope. <laughs> we've seen miraculous things in our lives, and yet I've done this myself, and I identify with Nebuchadnezzar in this. We see it, we, th we say praise God, and we move on with our lives and we focus on ourselves. Okay. I've titled this uh, sermon, um, Lessons Learned from FCA and Nebuchadnezzar, right? So lesson number one, um, this is Nebuchadnezzar here. He has looked at and seen miraculous things and yet forgotten. Let's not do that, <laughs> right? Instead, let's, let's figure out a way we can do the opposite of that. Let's remember the things that, that we have seen God do. Now, Tisha B'Av is a day of mourning, right? And that's an important day for Jewish people to recognize. But maybe, maybe there's a day in your life that you need to recognize and say, you know what, this is when God did a miraculous thing for me, and I want to praise God for that day. And this is what we do in the scriptures, at least. This is how God establishes many holidays, right? Passover, right? There's a huge event, a miraculous event, and now the Jewish people celebrate it. Maybe some Christians do too. I personally, I celebrate it. It's a beautiful celebration. The resurrection, right? Easter, 
We celebrate that day. Let's celebrate the miraculous things that God has done in our lives. Amen? Amen. All right, let's get to that text. The king has another dream, so he calls for Daniel, who warns him that the interpretation of the dream says he's got some bad times ahead. Um, this is where we pick it up, Daniel chapter 4, verses 28 through uh, 37 there at the end of the chapter. I'm going to read, if you would uh, read along with me, follow with your eyes, and I'll read out loud. This is verse 28. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar 12 months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of the time, this is Nebuchadnezzar here, he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back His hand or say to Him, What have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. King Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest ruler of his time, was humbled easily by Yahweh. Go eat grass. <laughs> wow. Wow. I've learned a lot from Nebuchadnezzar's story. In 2019, as I said, I was on top of the world. COVID happened. Everything fell apart for me. In ministry, I went from 20 campuses, 100 kids, five, five campuses, five, on, uh, five attendees online. My financial support dropped. I had to start working my other two jobs again, in addition to FCA. Then last July, as if everything wasn't peachy keen, I sprained my ankle. That was terrible. I live upstairs, by the way, in a second story building with no elevator, so that didn't help. <laughs> I dealt with a sprained ankle issue this last year, wondering half the time, God, what are you trying to teach me through this? I just want to learn that lesson so I can get better and move on with my life, right? Hmm. I finally recovered from that ankle sprain last month. I decided to go out and play some basketball. Because as Doc said, I play basketball. So what do I do? I go out there and I play too hard and I injure myself. <laughs> so I'm out for about a week, hobbling around. Oh, gosh, I can't run. Man. I'm old. <laughs> the next week after that, I finally recovered and I got COVID. That was bad. I don't recommend it. <laughs> I was out for another couple of weeks. And then just this last week, I was preparing for this sermon and I made a huge, stupid mistake with my wife. I did it. It was me. <laughs> right? And so in the midst of this whole thing, I'm like, God, what are you teaching me? What are you teaching me? It's not exactly the same as King Nebuchadnezzar, I know, but it has definitely felt like my kingdom has been crumbling. It has been humbling. I find that I even get a lot of the basics wrong sometimes. <laughs> they say, bye guys, see you next week, right? <laughs> but James reminds us, I don't control the week. <laughs> if you were paying attention in 2020, man, if whew, that's a lesson we all should have learned. 
James 4 says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. <laughs> what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Hmm. With all of his power, Nebuchadnezzar was not in control. I am not in control. Despite my pride, despite my abilities, I am not in control. I was told I could work hard, I could succeed in life, I could succeed in my academics, in my athletics, and yes, in my Christianity. I could work hard enough and I could do the right things and therefore good things would happen to me. I thought maybe I could gain a little bit of control. I thought if I did it all right, if I was good enough, I could take the controls of the universe from the nail-scarred hands of the mighty King Jesus. <laughs> Oof. Who am I? He is in control. He is in control of my marriage. He is in control of my ministry. He is in control when I mess up. He's in control when there's a foolish, prideful king. <laughs> He's in control when a pandemic is raging across the world. He is in control when I'm worried about my finances, my health, my family, my doggies, <laughs> whatever it is, he is in control. And I'm learning this slowly, and it's taken a hammer from God <laughs> to pound it into my head, but it's okay that I'm not. I can learn to trust someone else to be in control. I can learn to let go. I went deep sea fishing with my brother-in-law earlier this summer. Um, We'd wanted to go out, there we are. <laughs> We'd wanted to go, uh, get out and do something fun together for a long time. We had done this once before, but it had been five years or so. Um, we charted a couple of spots on a boat with a bunch of other guys who we didn't know. Um, there was a, a fishing guide and some other staff on the boat. And we kind of knew what we were doing in one sense, right? But we'd mess things up pretty quickly. <laughs> we'd get our lines tangled or we'd catch the plug. Have you guys ever caught the plug, anybody? You know what that means? Let me, let me explain it to you. You're out on the boat in a lake, ocean, wherever. You cast out your line and you just let it out and it just keeps going. And you're like, okay, all right, I'm gonna catch something. You start reeling it in, you start reeling it in. And then all of a sudden, oh, well, it feels like, oh, I caught something. I got something, I got something. And you start reeling it and pulling it, reeling it and pulling it, reeling it and pretty soon it's, I can't, I can't. And then the old fisherman comes by and he says, huh, you caught the plug. What does he mean? Caught the bottom of the ocean, right? The only plug on the bottom of the ocean. If you pull too hard, it drains the whole ocean. <laughs> oh, man. Whenever my brother-in-law or I would catch the plug or get tangled up or just need some assistance in some way, we had to call the guide over and surrender the rod and reel. And then he would fix it. And he would kind of saunter over. Yep, I'll take it. So how are you doing today? Snip. Tie a little knot. All right. And then he gives us a pearl of wisdom. Like, don't cast your line too close to that other guy's line. <laughs> Real simple. <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> oh, man. If only, if only I were able to let go of that rod and reel more easily. Because you see, guys, when I was fishing, I thought I got it. I thought I can do this. I know how to do this. I don't, and when I got it tangled up, I said, no, I don't need an old fisherman. I can do this by myself. <laughs> I couldn't. In my pride, I thought I could fix my own mistakes. I thought I could right my own wrongs. I thought I could be in control. I couldn't. When I let go, it means I let go of everything. It means I let go of my mistakes. That's the beauty in it, right? I allow Jesus to fix me up so that I can get back out there and start fishing again, being a fisher of men, because that's what he's called us, his disciples, right? We're fishers of men. That's who I am. That's who you are too. Now, I'm just at the tip of the iceberg here, but I'm learning to be at peace with allowing God to be in control rather than me. I'm learning to be humble. My prayer today is for you to do some soul searching as well and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you some ways in which you can personally grow in your humility.
In fact, let's take a moment and do that right now. If you would just bow your heads and pray. Oh Lord, speak to us. Show us ways in which we need to grow in our humility. you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So in summary, there are two things I have learned from FCA and Nebuchadnezzar that I want to pass on to you today. Number one, set aside time to celebrate the miraculous work of God in your life. Number two, ask the Lord to show you how you can grow in humility. He's able to humble you anyway. <laughs> you might as well humble yourself. Again, celebrate the miracles, grow in humility. Amen? Amen. All right, I want to do something a little different here to close my time. I'd like us all to sing a song together. Uh, the song is based on actually James 4.10. It's an oldie, but it's a goodie. <laughs> We're going to try it out together. If you want to talk with me more about FCA afterwards, I'll be in the back. Or if you want to talk with me more about how I should humble myself afterwards, <laughs> feel free. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and sing this.